games console, a portable smart speaker, and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. Welcome to the show. It's 3 p.m. This is Martin Daubney on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, Rishi Sunak may have promised to stop the boats. And the government has now said we're going through a migration emergency. But its flagship Rwanda bill has been delayed once again. And it won't be debated again in the Commons before Easter. Some emergency. And to add to the pressure on the Prime Minister, a massive 514 migrants crossed the Channel yesterday and more have arrived today. That's the kind of records they don't want to break. Again, I say to you, what emergency? Now, hopes that the Bank of England will cut the interest rates have been dashed. Now, economics and business editor Liam Halligan will explain why he thinks that's a big mistake and he's normally always right. And there's great news for the women who suffered a delay in getting the state pension. They could get almost 3,000 quid in compo. And that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. We've got a veritable meat feast ahead, dripping with red meat. Here's one for you. If you had an emergency leak in your kitchen, would you wait a month for it to get fixed? Would you wait a month for that to get sorted out? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have done pronto, sharpish, today, right now. That's an emergency, right? So this migration emergency, how come they're all swanning off for a month's break? How come they're laughing at us now? It feels that way to me. Let me know what you think. GB Views at at gbnews.com. Lee Anderson asked for an emergency in September 2022. We're now in the spring of 2024. Now that is what I, what I would call a pregnant pause. Get in touch the usual way, gbviews at gbnews.com. But first, time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst.
Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, I can tell you the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent for the fifth time in a row today. Bank Governor Andrew Bailey saying the economy wasn't yet at the point where rates could be lowered, but he said things are moving in the right direction. Well, we've been asking people in Hull what the latest interest rate figure means to them. But it concerns me about the elderly who are just on old age pensions because uh, uh, that affects them quite a lot. And young families as well, you know, particularly single parents um, and people on mortgages as well in particular. You don't really get much if you think about it. If you look in your bank and you f look at it, it's not really that much because you've got your bills to pay. And if you've got like debts or anything to pay, that's just then going to go. So you're not going to see it in the benefit. Everything's becoming more expensive, so I've just had to move back up here from Coventry. Um, the prices down there are, are obviously a little bit more than they are up here, but it's more your everyday living, like going to the shop, buying your food, etc. Been working in hospitality, which isn't the best, the best industry for an income. Um, so I was struggling, I was struggling to keep afloat, and therefore I've had to, had to move back in with my parents up here. Now, thousands of women may be eligible for compensation after a new report found that the Department for Work and Pensions failed to adequately inform them that the state pension age was changing. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman looked at potential injustices resulting from the decision to raise women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's in 2010. Well, the Women Against State Pension Inequality, the WASPI campaign, is suggesting that there should be £10,000 in compensation for each person, claiming that millions of women born in the 1950s weren't properly warned about the changes and that caused them financial hardship after being unable to plan. Shadow Secretary Yvette Cooper says it's important to take the report very seriously. I think this is a really important issue because many women across the country just feel like they had the goalposts moved from them at the time when they didn't know what was changing. And so that's why I think it's really important that we look at this report. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that people will be looking really seriously at it. The Home Secretary. Now, number 10 has said it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number this year so far. And today, at least another 300 migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats so far. Meanwhile, a South Sudanese man has been jailed for piloting a dangerously overcrowded small boat as it made its way across the English Channel last August. 31-year-old Chul Farn Marker was caught steering the vessel with 52 migrants balanced on board, many of whom were forced to perch dangerously on the sides. The Home Office released a series of images taken by Border Force officials of the dangerously overcrowded craft. The Work and Pensions Secretary is warning that Britain's acceptance of a mental health culture has gone too far. Speaking as he unveiled plans to get 150,000 people back to work, Mel Stride said that the benefits bill was being pushed up by a sharp increase in the number of people who are on long-term sickness. In an interview with The Telegraph, he suggested an increased public focus on talking about mental health had led people to self-diagnose conditions. It comes as the welfare bill is set to hit £100 billion this year. Shadow Work and Pensions Minister Alison McGovern says Labour does have a plan for that. What needs to be addressed is to make sure that we have good work in this country that supports people's good mental health, as I just mentioned. And alongside that, we need a mental health system as part of our NHS that can really help people. You know, if you're a child or a young person needing mental health support, the waiting list can be years long, and that's not good enough. So we need Labour's plan to support our health service, including mental health support, with 8,500 extra mental health workers, so that we can improve that quality of service for people. That's Labour's plan. Four environmental protesters have pleaded not guilty to criminal damage at the Prime Minister's Yorkshire home. The Greenpeace activist draped Rishi Sunak's constituency house in Yorkshire with anti-oil and gas banners last year. Each of the accused denied charges of criminal damage to roof slates after the group was pictured sitting on the Prime Minister's roof whilst he was away on holiday. The two-day trial will start in July. 
The Queen has said His Majesty King Charles is doing very well. She was speaking on a visit to Belfast. Camilla was handed a Get Well Soon card as well for her husband, who's undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King has been meeting the new High Commissioners from Tanzania and Singapore at Buckingham Palace today. And three staff members from the London Clinic are being investigated over allegations they tried to access the Princess of Wales' private medical files. The individuals could face prosecution under data protection legislation and could also be sued for damages by Catherine. It's understood the King's medical records weren't compromised when he was treated at the same hospital for an enlarged prostate. The London Clinic has promised investigatory, regulatory and disciplinary steps be taken. Now, Easter eggs are going to cost at least twice as much this year. Researchers are blaming climate change for the increase after dry weather in West Africa led to a spike in global cocoa prices. Brands including Maltesers, Lint and Cadbury all will cost at least 50% more than a year ago, while others have shrunk in size. That's according to the consumer group, which... Those are the top stories. For more, sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now, we start with yet another delay to the government's flagship Rwanda bill. And MPs won't even debate the legislation again until after Easter, dealing a fresh blow to Rishi Sunak's promise to stop the boat. And the House of Lords inflicted a set of defeats once again on the government last night. And meanwhile, 514 migrants crossed the Channel yesterday, making it the busiest day of migrant arrivals so far this year. You can bet your bottom dollar that record will be surpassed. And more have even made the journey across the Channel once again today. Well, I'm joined now by GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris... An emergency. They're calling it an emergency. As I said at the top of the show, what kind of an emergency do you take a month off to sort? Are they just laughing well, it's worse at us than now? that, Martin? Because this was an emergency legislation, and that's why the Prime Minister to deal with the small boats crisis. Now, let's rewind to the beginning of all this. The Rwanda plan was first announced by Boris Johnson in April 2022, nearly two years ago. Two prime ministers since then. Finally, the government got round to pushing forward what, what, how this would look, having got, got it through the, 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 the courts as, as it was then. They, uh, through the Supreme Court. So this safety of Rwanda bill was billed as an emergency. Now, an emergency bill, you can get through the House of Commons, both all and Parliament, within a matter of weeks. We are now approaching the fourth month of waiting for this to happen. If you have an emergency at home and, the, and, the, and there's, a, there's a plumber's called out, you fix the leak straight away. You don't wait four months for your entire house to be flooded, but that appears to be what's happen happened. Um, we had an meeting today with the um, number 10 spokesman. It got quite testy. At one point, someone said, you know, you're, you're taking voters for fools. If you think this is a way of tackling mm. the migrant crisis, well, why aren't you doing it? 514 arrived yesterday. The numbers so far this year are up 10% on last year, and last year was when it fell by, by 30%. How did they react when, when they, it was put to them they're taking voters for schools? They said, no, they are, we are trying to do it. So what I said, well, why not get on with it? You've got three more city days before Easter break. Today, Thursday, Monday and Tuesday. Instead, they're doing some other... They're obviously more important legislation about something to do with, with um, so the security services must go through. But this is a crisis. Instead, we're waiting until the 15th of April, that week, when it might, might start being pushed through from the Commons. What happens next, of course, is the Commons have to re reverse those seven attempts to weaken the bill um, on that Monday or Tuesday. Then it goes back to the Lords for a third time, and that might be it. So there's a hope you might get royal assent by the end of that week. And then it could be a six-week wait while all the individual people are, 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 are contacted saying you're on the first flight out of here, um, it could be late May, late May, maybe even early June. We're pushing this spring deadline the PM has come up with. Do you think, Chris, that this kind of procrastination, this kind of inactivity, this kind of broken promises repeatedly on top, and I know I mentioned Brexit all the time, but we saw then as at the beginnings of a breakdown of that fundamental mm. trust in our elected representatives to actually well, do Bre what Brexit the has been well a complete told. disappointment for so many people. 
I've interviewed Sir Geoffrey Cox on my podcast tomorrow. We'll discuss that tomorrow on the programme. Um, Brexit was an opportunity, I think, for people in this country, officials, MPs, to take back control of a third of of, uh, of laws that were decided and dealt with in Brussels to the to the to Whitehall and Westminster. Yes, there's been the COVID pandemic that, that started a month a month after we left the European Union in January 2020. Yes, there's a brief pause, and then the then the U Ukraine invasion by Russia that prompted an energy shock. There's been a lot of things happening. Mm. But I think Brexit has not worked. And there's a feeling that the, that the people voted in 2016 for change and it hasn't been grasped by the people who run this country. And it looks like this, the road is running out for this Tory party. I've had a text here from uh, Labour um, since I was tweeting about this on social media. They said Labour is ready to vote on Monday. Maybe a holiday for the Tories. It's not for Labour. They're making very clear that they are willing to get on with it. A rebel from the Tory side has sent me a note also saying the Rwanda bill is a total dud. It won't, it won't stop the boats. They're fighting for survival, tracking it just 19 points in the polls at the Tory party. Yeah, and that brings me neatly on to my next point. So this poll you mentioned there, YouGov out today, Tories on 19, it's placed the Reform Party on 15, four points behind, the Tories dropping one reform, putting one on. And actually, Chris, when you delve into that data a bit further, it's even more concerning for the Conservative Party. The Reform Party are actually overtaken the Conservatives in the North with Leave voters. They're more popular than they are with the Conservatives. And with the elder voters, these are died in the world Conservative voters, they are switching to reform in their droves. Will this continue, though, to an election, or is this like a protest poll ahead of the fact that it's so disappointed what's going it, on? It could be. The polls are disastrous. We're getting near uh, margin of error territory when it's plus or minus two points. And, you know, this idea of crossover, we often discuss in this programme, when reform crossover and become unbelievably the second party polling behind uh, Labour, um, when the Tories, uh, well, forgive me, when reform was a Brexit party, won the, um, the EU election. UKIP in 2014, mm -hmm. and then of course it was well, your party, the Brexit Party, in 2019. That triggered a complete panic among Tory ranks. That will happen. Labour, though, is making very clear, you know, it's willing to sort of hoover up all the disaffected votes. Earlier, we heard from Yvette Cooper uh, with her only criticism of, of the government's approach to small boats. Here's what she had to say. We've seen now that more people arrived on small boats yesterday than the government is planning to send to Rwanda in the next 12 months. And that just shows the gimmick that is the Rwanda policy that involves them sending £500 million to Rwanda for just 300 people. Instead of the gimmick, what we should be doing is putting that investment into improving our border security, going after the criminal gangs and also setting up a returns unit so that we make the system work, get a grip instead of the gimmicks. OK, well, joining us now is the political editor for HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield. Kev, welcome to the show. Always an absolute Hello. pleasure. An emergency, they're calling it. An emergency with a month-long waiting list. If you called a plumber and they were going to take a month, you'd sack them off. What kind of seriousness are they actually treating this with if they're if, as Chris Hope said, well, they sort of take the voters now for absolute idiots. Yeah, I think it shows that Rishi Sunak places party management above actually getting this bill through. So I was one of the journalists outside Committee Room 14 last night in the House of Commons uh, when Rishi Sunak appeared before the 1922 committee. Now, he was a little bit late in turning up. Um, and while we were waiting for him, there was a lot of cheers from inside the room. And we couldn't quite understand why that was, because normally the cheers wait until the Prime Minister actually shows up. We found out today that, that was because um, the MPs were told, basically, you're on holiday from tonight. You don't have to turn up next week. Uh, this bill's not coming back. So they all started cheering because they were able to go off on their holidays a little bit earlier. So that shows to me, I think, that the Prime Minister places keeping his MPs on side. Clearly, he has to do that as well, especially at the moment when there's all this leadership speculation going around. Um, he places that above getting this legislation through because, as Chris was just saying there, Labour have said they're they're around next week. They're happy to uh, uh, vote on this bill. They'll obviously vote against it, but they will be around um, if the, um, the government wants to bring it back to the House of Commons after they, they lost another seven votes on it in the Lords last night. So, uh, so yeah, it was quite... Astonishing. One MP who was in the room said to me, yeah, it was cheered by 
uh, the same MPs who didn't want an early election because they want another six months' wages before they lose their seats. So, uh, so yeah, I think that gives you an idea of where the, the Conservative Party's head is at right now, and it certainly isn't, it would appear, um, getting this bill on the statute books um, as soon as the Prime Minister earlier indicated he wanted it to be. Kev, if only we'd had a reaction cam in the studio here when you told us that the reason they were cheering wasn't because Rishi Sunak has, has managed not to get enough letters in to have a leadership challenge, but instead they were cheering the fact they were throwing their caps in the air to the fact they're getting a month off you know, on the never-never while we wait for this so-called emergency to get sorted out. Chris Hope's jaw hit the table. <laughs> you know, so did mine. This is absolutely astonishing. Yeah, well, as I say, we were we were a bit confused outside because this cheering was going on, and um, uh, I double checked with an MP today. Once we'd heard that there's this in the jargon a one line whip next week, which effectively means that MPs don't really need to turn up because there aren't any important votes for them. And I texted an MP who was in the room and said, "Is that, by the way, is that maybe why they were cheering last night?" And he said, "Yes." So um, they were told, you know, next week effectively. You've, uh, you can go back to your constituencies. So, uh, so yeah, that is basically, as I say, where the party said is that. And it's ironic that as they were cheering and they were cheering the Prime Minister as well a little bit later, you know, literally at the same time, they were losing these votes in the House of Lords, despite the fact that they had um, flown back MP uh, Lords, I should say, from abroad. Lords, Tory Lords who don't really show up very often came back especially to vote um, last night, they were told that their presence was required. In the end, they still lost the votes reasonably easily. Um, and now we know that these lords are really, really annoyed that um, after all the hoo-ha last night, the bill isn't actually even going to be coming back now till after Easter. Kevin, it's Chris, Chris Hopi in the studio. I, I, I didn't know that, that they were given three days early holiday uh, I was elsewhere in the building in Parliament reporting for GP News. I mean, it is extraordinary that this is meant to be an, a, an emergency, they say in the morning lobby meeting today. It was emergency legislation, as you said, uh, last November. But they're giving um, MPs three days off early. Why not try and push it through now and, and put the heat back on the peers over the Easter break? Instead, we've got this three or four week break before it comes back. And, I mean, do you think they are taking voters, GB News viewers, listeners for fools? I think, as I say, I think it shows that the Prime Minister is so worried about his own position that he's more interested in currying favour with his MPs. Obviously, they, you know, just moments after being told that they were um, able to go back to their constituencies a little bit earlier, probably than they'd expected, the Prime Minister came in and the cheers that he got and the banging on the desks and the, and the roars of approval were absolutely astonishing. You would have thought that he had just uh, won a landslide election victory. I mean, outside, we all, journalists were all having a bit of a laugh about it because it was so over the top because, you know, you'll know yourself, Chris, you, it's not difficult to find MPs who are very unhappy with Rishi mm. Sunak. So the idea that was being transmitted from inside the room last night was that actually, you know, he's some sort of conquering hero and they all love him to bits. Um, we know that's not true, but now we know we know that part of the reason, I think, was because they were actually quite pleased that um, they weren't going to have to come back to Parliament next week. Kevin Schofield, it's not often that I'm lost for words on this show, but the idea that these peers are dragged to the province from the provinces, they get 300 quid for showing up for, for half an hour's work, and they're upset about that. And then they're cheering when they're given a few days mm. off. Absolutely, MPs. MPs, absolutely staggering. Kevin Schofield, the political editor for Huff Post UK, thanks, I guess, for joining us and sharing <laughs> that with us. Just absolutely gobsmacked, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> it's surprising. I just, don't, I just don't understand why they can't see there was a, is a political advantage for this for this government to get this over the line and start to try and get the flights taken off. There, was, there were people, our listeners, viewers, you're seeing on your socials now, Martin, it's over, it's, it's on fire, it's steaming over there, I can yeah, see. There, there was, there was a, a political uh, advantage for the Tory party to get ahead of this. So why are they giving them three days off early before? I, I just don't know. And then they're all cheering. And so they go, I mean, it is, it's like, it, it, it does it does beg a belief. Yeah, we've gone through the looking glass. Look, we'll have lots more on that story throughout the show. I'm still in a state of shock and at four o'clock I'll be joined by Tory MP Miriam Cates. Let's ask her if she was one of those cheering. And there's plenty of coverage now on our website, gbnews.com, and you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country.
Now it's time for the great British giveaway. We've got a shopping spree, a guarding gadget bundle, and 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five, tax-free pounds in cash. Now here's all the details that you need to get your claws on the moolah. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Okay, now the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent. And it's fair to say our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, thinks that's the total wrong decision. We'll find out soon why. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now, uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to our conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you it. Commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. It's 3.26. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll bring you an exclusive report on a major drugs bust by the Metropolitan Police, which GB News attended. 
Now, the Bank of England announced it will hold the base rate at 5.25% for the fifth consecutive time. It's a good news for savers, but not for mortgage owners as they continue to face sky-high borrowing rates. Well, here to break it down is GB News' business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, it's always an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. You know that, my friend. You didn't want this decision. You think it would have been a better thing. We should have some fiscal stimulus. Instead, we got a bit too much caution. Yeah, I do think the Bank of England is slightly hamstrung by its previous decisions. It's now trying to prove how tough it is on inflation by keeping rates too high for too long, having been very slow to recognise that inflation was coming back in 2021 and 2022. But let's just recap for GB News viewers and listeners what happened at 12 noon. What happened at 12 noon, Martin, is that the Bank of England's nine-strong monetary policy committee, a bunch of uh, economists, they voted by eight to one to keep interest rates on hold at 5.25%. That's a 16-year high. We can see here on our WYSI GB News graphic, we can see that interest rates were very, very were, were low, rose slightly ahead of the COVID lockdown. During COVID lockdown, they went all the way down to 0.25%. That's a, a record low in UK history. And then after COVID ended, the lockdown ended, we had that large increase in inflation all the way up to 11%. And interest rates rose. The Bank of England did successive interest rate rises to try and bear down on inflation. Now inflation's come down a lot from 11%. Back in late 22, the last number we got on in inflation is only 4% in February, during the year to February. Price rises are easing, but prices are still going up a bit. The Bank of England is under a lot of pressure to cut rates, but it still isn't. I have to say, though, that since the rate decision came out, the Bank of England governor has stressed, Andrew Bailey, that inflation's moving in the right direction and there is talk of interest rates to come quite soon. I can't see it happening, though, when the Monetary Policy Committee is voting by 8 to 1, a very big majority. I can't see them reversing that in a month or even two months. So I, I, I reckon the first rate cut in the UK will be May at best, but probably June. OK, so, Liam, taking your hat off in terms of reporting and now put your hat on in terms of your opinion, why do you think this was a bit too flighty? I think it's a bit too flighty because it's clear that inflation is falling and it's going to fall really quite rapidly in the next few months. We could be down at 2% in the next month or two, and that is the Bank of England's target. And there's already an awful lot of tightening in the system. What do I mean by that? When you raise interest rates 15-odd times, as the Bank of England has over the last 18 months or so, those interest rate rises take time to feed through. And we haven't yet felt the full impact of those interest rate rises. So mm. I think we should be reversing those interest rate rises as soon as possible. The UK economy is just about growing. It's been flatlining. GDP per head, that's the size of the economy per person, has actually been shrinking for the last year and more. And I think now it would be safe to lower interest rates a bit. But, you know, these days, the Monetary Policy Committee, unlike when it began when the Bank of England was given independence in 1997. These days, the Monetary Policy Committee is full of very cautious, largely Treasury-appointed people. There's very little kind of cognitive diversity. What do I mean by that? It, that's the opposite of groupthink. <laughs> There's too much groupthink on the Monetary Policy Committee. There aren't enough people of serious intellectual calibre who use that calibre to dare to have a different opinion from the rest of the group, an opinion they can back up with evidence on authority. We desperately need, in my view, to get people on the Monetary Policy Committee who are not the usual suspects, who are not just the establishment, civil servant-type economists, people who come from business, from commerce, from the real world, if I may say so. That is a, a, an issue, I think, for the Bank of England. At least, Martin, that's my opinion.
Yeah, and a lot of people watching this, Liam Halligan, me included, would probably be hoping that you could be one of those guys making the calls and not them instead. Liam Halligan, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the show. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, and we'll cover the big news that millions of women who had to wait longer to get the state pension could be in line for some compensation. But first, it's time for your ladies' news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Top stories this hour. As you've been hearing, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent for the fifth time in a row. The bank governor, Andrew Bailey, saying the economy isn't yet at the point where rates can be lowered, but he said things are moving in the right direction. Number 10 has said today that it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number so far this year. And today, at least another 300 migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats. Four environmental protesters have pleaded not guilty to criminal damage of the Prime Minister's home. The Greenpeace activist draped Rishi Sunak's constituency home in Yorkshire with anti-oil and gas banners last year. Each of the accused denied charges of criminal damage to roof slates after the group was pictured sitting on the Prime Minister's roof while he was away on holiday. The two-day trial starts in July. And the Queen has said King Charles is doing very well. She was on a visit to Belfast and was handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband, who's undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King himself has been meeting the new High Commissioners for Tanzania and Singapore at Buckingham Palace today. Those are the latest news headlines. For the latest stories, sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Let's take a look at the markets for you and the pound buying you $1.2674 and €1.1662. The price of gold is £1,714.73 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 is currently standing at 7,894 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you very much, Polly. Now, do black women need to work much harder than their white colleagues to progress in the police? Well, that's the claim being made by an outreach officer in the Met. Our reporter, Charlie Peters, will bring us an exclusive on this astonishing story next. I'm Martin Dormley on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months, but if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know, taking great measures. Well, to I think that. one of Punishing. their plans is to have a national 
register, hmm. which, 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 would, which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's it's almost it's you can't well, they can't deal with the real problem. So they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know for to save money, frankly. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 3.37 is your time. I'm Martin Dalby on GB News. Now, later in the show, we'll get a reaction to the alleged data breach involving the Princess of Wales. Still talking about that all these days on. But before that, we've got a cracking exclusive here from Charlie Peters. The Metropolitan Police is being branded as embarrassing after footage emerged of its outreach teams telling pr prospective recruits that black women have to work much harder than their white colleagues. Well, the outreach team also featured footage of an officer saying that he didn't want to invalidate ethnic minorities who were racially abusive to him while on duty. Being a woman in today's world and being a black woman does have an extra layer of complexity, however, and struggle, and means that often at times I have to work much harder to be seen, to be heard, and to receive the same level of equality as my white female counterparts. Joined and black people in the public were racially abusive to me, uh, absolutely hated my existence. It took me about four months, five months, till one of them said, Do you know the history of the area that you're working in and the organization that you're working for? And I said, No. Nope. He said, Go read this and watch this. So I did that. Ever since that, the ability to resonate with people, it's been untold. Um, for example, being at a crime scene and they come and they insult you, you know that's not personal. I've learned that it's not personal, but I'm not going to invalidate them and say, no, that wasn't me. It wasn't me. Things that happened before I was born. OK, well, joining yeah. me now in the studio is the reporter who got that cracking exclusive, Charlie Peters, who uncovered the footage. What else is going on here? Well, this is footage that's been put out by an outreach team. These are people trying to recruit new officers into the Metropolitan Police, in particular those from underrepresented ethnic minorities within the force. We know from the latest data released at the end of February that some 74% of officers within the Met are white British, which is against 36% of the wider London uh, population. So clearly a large overrepresentation in that case. And the Met says that they are more diverse than ever and that they have these outreach teams in order to improve those growing statistics. However, people I've spoken to involved in this world who are engaged in sort of outreach and recruitment have expressed some concern. al Gal Galcuthbert from Don't Divide Us, an anti-racist campaign, told GB News that this stuff was embarrassing and had the strong whiff of desperation because it was essentially telling black recruits into the police, that you're going to have to work so much harder. And people looking at this dispassionately and from a neutral perspective might, might think, if this is recruitment, who on earth would be seeing that you know, uh, as a black civilian in London and thinking, I've got to become a police officer, having learnt that it's so much harder to be black in the police than it is to be white in the police? It's also worth noting that we've uncovered this footage one year after Baroness Louise Casey's review into the Met found, in her perspective, that it was institutionally racist, homophobic and sexist. Now, the Met and its commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, have always denied the claim institutional. But some of the footage that we've seen on this Met-connected outreach team includes them 
also using the term systemic bias yes. against black officers and that it's an institutional issue, very much using the language of Casey that the Met doesn't want to see with its officers. Now, Charlie, this comes as a surprise to me on many levels, but I live in London. I see Metropolitan Police Force recruitment posters every single day on public transport. You'd be hard pushed to spot a white man on any of them. Oh. They're like dodos. They're that rare. They are continually outreaching and pushing for ethnic minorities to join the force. We hear all the time of efforts which seem over and above the duty. We hear from other forces, fire services across the board, the RAF, the idea that you, you've got less chance of getting a job if you apply as a white man. Is this true? Well, I don't think there's anything that necessarily shows that there's an issue with the recruitment pipeline, that there's a blockage in the process for non-whites. What we did found, however, is that when we raised this issue with the Mets press team, that, vote, that video was then deleted, the video of mm. the woman saying it's so much harder to be a black woman than, um, than her white colleagues because they weren't seen and they weren't heard and they don't get the same equality. That, that video was removed. Of course, we'd already saved it, some basic due diligence on our, mm. on our parts. But there's so much more footage. As we said, there, there's a, a, a VR, a virtual reality session they did, which was trying to take serving officers through the perspective of a black officer, saying that their day-to-day -day experience is filled with bias and they have to overcome additional hurdles. Systemic bias, again, using that language that, that Casey believes, but that Sir Mark Rowley has rejected. That's going to create more controversy, and it does appear mm. that there is a split between the official outreach team and, indeed, the Met senior leadership. OK, well, we have a quick statement to read out, because in response, a Met police spokesperson has said this. We are the most diverse we have ever been, but we know there is more to do. We will continue every effort to make sure we are attracting a workforce of the future that is as diverse as possible. We are equally committed to making the Met an inclusive place to work where all our people can thrive. Well, thank you very much for bringing that great story to us, Charlie Peters. Another great one. Keep digging. Now, GB News has been given exclusive access to a police raid where thousands of pounds worth of narcotics were seized. We'll have great footage from that next. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. Uh, tonight, we've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of Southern England, East Anglia will stay uh, dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow, and some very gusty winds, a very windy night across northern Scotland. It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers, though, also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. Very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday will see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. 
GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. The time is 3.47. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, at four o'clock, I'll get reaction to the news that more than 800 migrants have crossed the channel since yesterday morning. 800 in two days. Stop the boat. Mm. Now, thousands of pounds worth of narcotics were seized in a dawn raid in London yesterday as the Metropolitan Police target sophisticated drug dealing groups. In a broadcast exclusive, Ray, GB News's Ray Addison was asked to ride along and film a rather rude awakening. Daybreak in Hillingdon, northwest London. And an alleged drug dealer is about to get an unexpected wake up call from the Met. Inside the flat is a 29 year old male suspect. <laughs> who police believe is part of a network distributing narcotics to over 100 people. For the Met, this is just the latest arrest in Operation Yamata, a London-wide crackdown where specialist teams target sophisticated drug-dealing groups. Detective Chief Inspector Erin Kerr is in charge. And we would call him the, um, the controller of this network. So he's the one that's operating uh, this line. He controls this line, he owns this line. They are often the men of violence, so they're not just known for drug supply, but they're known for a lot of other um, violent offences that impact the community. Back inside the flat in the living room, PCs Anna Harwood and Kevin McLean have found what appears to be Class A drugs. That looks like crack cocaine. About an ounce, probably. They say the crack alone has a street value of almost £3,000. This is heroin, I believe. It's been divided up into individual wraps and wraps ready for homeward supply to the end users. Um, this is cling film. These are the brown Rizla papers that are used to wrap uh, the heroin. Cling film's used to wrap the crack. Uh, this is going to be the heroin. So that would have made into that. This would eventually have been broken down using the scales it was just all being done on this table. And then obviously we found the drug line that used to send out the bog messages. PC McLean warns the heroin could be laced with nitazines, a deadly synthetic opioid outlawed by the government just this week. Uh, basically they're like 100 times stronger than like morphine and fentanyl. Basically when the heroin's laced with it, they're, yeah, they're like lethal. With this latest arrest under Operation Yamata, officers believe they've taken down the final connection in a London drugs line that's been operating for years and thousands of pounds of Class A narcotics are off the streets. <laughs> Police say the suspect was arrested on suspicion of supplying Class A drugs and remains in custody for questioning. But until that news filters down to the streets, his suspected drug line will keep ringing off the hook. Ray Addison, GB News. Cracking stuff there from Ray Addison. Now, women born in the 1950s are owed compensation after being hit by the state's pension age change. A reporter suggested women should receive a payout of between £1,000 and £2,950 as the Ombudsman looks at potential injustices after the decision to raise women's retirement age to bring it into line with men's. Well, I'm joined now by our political correspondent in our studio in Westminster, Catherine Forster. Catherine, this is something that campaigns have been fighting for for many, many years. A victory. Well, yes. Uh, no. So this uh, investigation, five years, the Ombudsman has finally reported and effectively have said that Department of Work and Pensions 
didn't do their job properly in that uh, they didn't sufficiently um, educate women to the fact that the pension uh, age was changing to bring it in line ultimately with men's and also the factor, the number of national insurance years, the number of stamps you needed to mm. pay to qualify for your full pension. So they have said that they don't think... They, they said the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, will not take steps to put this right. So they are presenting this report directly to Parliament mm. and asking for MPs to act. But, I mean... The problem with this is, of course, that it's likely to be expensive. There's over three and a half million women affected. Estimates range from 3.5 to 10.5 billion Crikey. for the government to pay out on this. And let's have a quick look now at what the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, had to say about this earlier. Oh, we okay, don't, we, we we don't, don't have, that. have that. But basically what she said was, oh, you know, these women feel like they've had the goalpost change. I want to look at this yeah. carefully. She was asked then if the Labour Party, if they come to power, would pay out. She did not answer mm. that. She just repeated, I want to look at it carefully. Uh, and the, the point is, they don't want to commit to paying that because it's going to be a big bill. Exactly. Now, Mel Stride, um, the um, Work and Pension Secretary, um, will likely appear before Parliament, uh, but I don't really expect anybody to be saying, OK, we're going to write this cheque and we're going to do it uh, in the next few months because... We've got a national debt of 2.6 trillion, taxes yes. at a 70-year high, money is very tight, a general election coming, and also these women who, you know, many of them, it has had a really adverse effect on their lives because they didn't know, they would have made different decisions, etc. But post office scandal victims still waiting for compensation, tainted blood victims, these are things going back decades with very, very large bills. And what we see over and over again is the government of the day uh, find a reason to take their time so that they don't have to be the ones that pay. That's right. We have a spokesperson for the Department for Work and Pensions who said this. We will consider the Ombudsman's report and respond in due course, having cooperated fully throughout this investigation. The government has always been committed to supporting all pensioners in a sustainable way that gives them a dignified retirement whilst also being fair to them and taxpayers. The state pension is the foundation of income in retirement and will remain so as we deliver a further 8.5% rise in April, which will increase the state pension for 12 million pensioners by £900. Will that be sufficient? There's a lot of votes in this. If the Labour Party grabbed this and ran with it, 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 it will please them. Yes, there are a lot of votes in it, uh, but also... The government are in a very tricky financial situation and the Labour Party are saying that they will abide by all these fiscal rules. So money is very tight. There are votes in it, but I'm not convinced that action is going to be swift. OK, Catherine Forster, thank you very much. Now, the government has said we're experiencing a migration emergency. But if that's right, why are they giving MPs extra days off before Easter. Are they taking us for absolute fools? We found out at the top of this hour that MPs cheered last night, not because Rishi Sunak avoided the bullet at the 1922 committee, but because they were given four days off. I'm Martin Dormley on Britain's News Channel. We'll have more of that after this. But first, it's time for your weather with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. Uh, tonight, we've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of southern England, East Anglia, will stay dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow. And some very gusty winds, a very windy night across northern Scotland.
It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, Northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers, though, also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. And very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday will see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double t UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 4pm and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up, Rishi Sunak may have promised to stop the boats and the government has now said we're going through a migration emergency. This flagship Rwanda bill has been delayed again and it won't be debated again in the Commons before Easter. Does that sound like an emergency to you? To add to the pressure on the Prime Minister, a massive 514 migrants crossed the Channel yesterday. A record number and even more have arrived today. I say again, does that sound like an emergency to you? 
Next, hopes that the Bank of England would cut the interest rate have been dashed. And our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, will explain why he thinks that's a big mistake. And we'll be covering a shocking report revealing that the number of severely absent pupils has soared by 133.6% since the pandemic. They're missing out on school, and that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. It's fantastic as ever to have your company. An emergency, they're calling it, and yet they've been given four days off. We found out at the top of the last hour from Kevin Schofield at HuffPost, Tory MPs cheered last night, not because Rishi Sunak hadn't got the necessary number of votes for a leadership contest to be triggered, but because they were cheering because they found out they'd been given a few days off. Does that sound like an emergency to you? Are they taking this seriously? Are they taking the mickey? Let me know what you think. Send in your, your opinions as ever, gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and I'll read out a selection throughout the show. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at 5.25% for the fifth time in a row. Bank Governor Andrew Bailey saying the economy not yet at the point where rates can be lowered, but things are moving in the right direction. The people of Hull have been telling GP News what the latest interest rate figure means to them. But it concerns me about the elderly who are just on old age pensions because uh, uh, that affects them quite a lot. And young families as well, you know, particularly single parents um, and people on mortgages as well in particular. You don't really get much if you think about it. If you look in your bank and you look at it, it's not really that much because you've got your bills to pay. And if you've got like debts or anything to pay, that's just then going to go. So you're not going to see it in the benefit. Everything's becoming more expensive, so I've just had to move back up here from Coventry. Um, the prices down there are, are obviously a little bit more than they are up here, but it's more your everyday living, like going to the shop, buying your food, etc. Been working in hospitality, which isn't the best, the best industry for an income. Um, so I was struggling, I was struggling to keep afloat, and therefore I've had to, had to move back in with my parents up here. Well, thousands of women may be eligible for compensation after a report found that the Department for Work and Pensions failed to adequately inform them that the state pension age was going to change. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman looked at potential injustices resulting from the decision to raise the women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's in 2010. Well, the Women Against State Pension Inequality campaign, WASPI, is suggesting there should be around £10,000 in compensation, claiming that millions of women born in the 50s weren't properly warned about the changes and that caused them financial hardship after being unable to plan. The new report suggests, however, they should receive a payout of between one and three thousand pounds instead. The Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, says it's important to take the report very seriously. I think this is a really important issue because many women across the country just feel like they had the goalposts moved from them at the time when they didn't know what was changing. And so that's why I think it's really important that we look at this report. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that people will be looking really seriously at it. Now, number 10 has said it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number this year so far. And today, at least another 300 migrants have arrived in Britain in six small boats. Meanwhile, a South Sudanese man has been jailed for piloting a dangerously overcrowded small boat as it's made its way across the English Channel in August. 31-year-old Kul Fan Marker was caught steering the vessel with 52 illegal migrants balanced on board, many of whom were forced to perch dangerously on each side. The Home Office has released a series of images taken by Border Force officials of the overcrowded boat. Now, Channel 4 says their investigation into the allegations against Russell Brand found no evidence that managers were aware of accusations about the comedian. In September, the 48-year-old was accused of rape, 
assault and emotional abuse after a joint investigation by the broadcaster, dispatches and the Times and the Sunday Times. Russell Brand has strongly denied all the accusations against him while at the height of his fame between 2006 and 2013. The Work and Pension Secretary is warning that Britain's acceptance of a mental health culture has now gone too far. Speaking as he unveiled plans to get 150,000 people back to work, Mel Stride said that the benefits bill was now being pushed up by a sharp increase in the number of people who are on long-term sickness. In an interview with The Telegraph, he suggested an increased public awareness of mental health had led to people self-diagnosing conditions. That comes as the welfare bill is set to hit £100 billion this year. Four environmental protesters have pleaded not guilty to criminal damage at the Prime Minister's home. The Greenpeace activist draped Rishi Sunak's constituency home in Yorkshire with anti-oil and gas banners last year. Each of the accused denied charges of criminal damage to roof slates after the group was pictured sitting on the Prime Minister's roof whilst he was away on holiday. The two-day trial starts in July. And the Queen has said His Majesty King Charles is doing very well. She was on a visit to Belfast today and she was handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband, who's undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King has been meeting the new High Commissioners for Tanzania and Singapore at Buckingham Palace. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now, we start with yet another delay to the government's flagship Rwanda bill. And MPs won't debate the legislation again until after Easter. Can you Adam and Eve it? And that's dealing a fresh blow to Rishi Sunak's promise to stop the boat. The House of Lords inflicted a set of defeats on the government, of course, last night. And meanwhile, 514 migrants crossed the channel yesterday, making it the busiest day of migrant arrivals so far this year. And more have made the crossing, of course, across the Channel today. Now, the government says it's a migration emergency. But does that sound like an emergency to you? Well, I'm joined in the studio once again by GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, in the last hour, we found out that Tory MPs were weeping with delight, mm. cheering about the fact they were being sent home to the shires four days early. It's fair to say our jaws hit the desk and we weren't at all happy. Hundreds of people have got in saying, what on earth are they playing at? They should be setting up job centres in Parliament. But I believe you've got an update. Well, that triggered a response from the system, the government. <clears throat> Let's leave it there. I can reveal that the government is looking at the 18th of April as a date for royal assent for yeah. the safety of Rwanda bill. They are going to have a, a day a voting on it on the Monday, the 15th, Tuesday the, the 16th, the vote, and then back with the Lords on the 17th, and it should get royal assent on the 18th. Part of the problem, apparently, is that the Buckingham Palace needs longer to deal with bills coming from, from Parliament to give literal royal assent, the literal um, signature by, by the King on a bill. That's obviously understandable. The King is undergoing treatment for cancer. It takes longer. So, they, so what's happened now? They've had to build in a longer time to ensure a bill gets royal assent. And that is part of the reason why they are targeting the 18th. I've also been told that we were questioning, well, it's an emergency bill back mm. in November last year. Why on earth is it taking three months to get it to this point? They said, well, that's the average time to get a bill out. And it, had they tried to rush it through in the, in the Commons, it's highly likely the House of Lords would have forced a select committee to examine it and slow it all down, saying that it was, a, it was a rushed bill. So they had to give it time in the Commons and the Lords. So they would say, the government would say, They've gone as fast as they can. But it does it does beg... We have heard today 514 arrived yesterday. It's up 10% year-on-year uh, so far this year on migrants arriving. Um, they are calling it a migrant emer migration emergency. Why were, why are MPs told that they could, they could go home early for Easter, effectively? It's not quite as simple as that. Anybody watching out there, Chris, we're thinking in whatever line of work they take part in, plumbers, plasterers, delivery drivers, teachers, whatever they may be, three months isn't an emergency, it's an eternity. They're moving at a snail's pace and many people, Chris, feel they're just laughing at us now. 
that, that is as far as you can go. Had they gone too quickly through the House of Commons, the laws would have delayed it again, and we uh, would end up at the same place, is the point. So we have got a date now. That's what we can reveal on, the, on, on, in, on, on your show. 18th of April is a date the government thinks they'll get royal assent. And then, of course, if, you, if that's the date, you have to add four to six weeks, maybe, to allow more challenges under the, under the, under the new, uh, by, by uh, lawyers acting for the cohort of migrants told to get on the first flight out of here. But it, it, they are trying to say we are going as fast as we can. OK, well, at least it shows that number 10 is watching GB News because they're reacting in real <laughs> they're reacting in real time to what we're putting out so that's good at and least. labor's playing up playing a game with this they're saying labor's ready to vote on monday it may be a holiday for the tories not for labor and earlier we heard from Yvette cooper and she has something to say about the migrants crossing yesterday We've seen now that more people arrived on send to Rwanda in the next 12 months. And that just shows the gimmick that is the Rwanda policy that involves them sending £500 million to Rwanda for just 300 people. Instead of the gimmick, what we should be doing is putting that investment into improving our border security, going after the criminal gangs, and also setting up a returns unit so that we make the system work, get a grip in instead of the gimmicks. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by the Conservative MP, Miriam Cates. Miriam, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Good Martin. afternoon, Great Miriam. Welcome. You. Welcome to the show. So um, it's being called an emergency, an immigration emergency. And we were just saying that taking a month to get this through, that doesn't seem like an emergency to most people. It seems like an eternity. Well, I can understand why people think that. And, of course, we want swift action, absolutely. And uh, I would agree with you, and I'm sure the majority of your viewers, that we urgently need to sort this situation out. And the sooner we get to the position where we have an effective deterrent in place, the better. But I think it's also important to point out that parliamentary scrutiny is a very important thing, and it's a very important part of our democracy. And it does normally take much, much longer than this to get legislation through. And, in fact, Cutting it too short, as Chris has pointed out, could have negative consequences. And if you think back to a few years ago at the start of the COVID pandemic, that first piece of legislation was absolutely rushed through Parliament with almost zero scrutiny. And we are still suffering uh, from the results of that. So, of course, people want this sorted out quickly, but we cannot sacrifice the very important uh, parliamentary scrutiny that we have in this country to make sure that legislation is safe and effective. OK, Miriam, we were joined on the show earlier by Kevin Schofield, who told us he overheard a cheer coming from a room in Parliament last night. I'd just like to play that clip to you now, please, and get your reaction to it. There's a lot of cheers from inside the room, and we couldn't quite understand why that was, because normally the cheers wait until the Prime Minister actually shows up. We found out today that, that was because um, the MPs were told Basically, you're on holiday from tonight. You don't have to turn up next week. Uh, this bill's not coming back. So they all started cheering because they were able to go off on their holidays a little bit early. So as you can imagine, Miriam, when, when we heard that, um, our jaws hit the desk in the studio here. I wonder if you had any reaction to the idea that MPs are cheering because they're being given days off during a so-called emergency. I wasn't actually in that meeting. If it was the 1922 committee, I had a meeting off-site. But... We are on a three-line whip on Monday, so I'm not quite sure. I don't think that story's true, because we are on a three-line whip on Monday. We have Jeez. to be in Parliament on Monday. So uh, we're certainly not finished for Easter. But I know it's very unpopular depending, uh, defending MPs. But I would point out that, yes, the parliamentary timetable does change frequently. Sometimes we're on a three-line whip when we're not expecting to be. Sometimes we're not when we are. But all my colleagues, uh, myself included, any day we're not in Parliament, we're in the constituency, meeting constituents, uh, responding to uh, situations on the ground. So, uh, of course, MPs will be taking an Easter break, as will many people, but the vast majority of my colleagues will be using that time in the constituency. Uh, we have the small matter of local elections coming up as well, so there'll be lots of door knocking going on. OK. Um, Miriam, it's Chris Hope here in studio with Martin. Have you seen the polling from YouGov overnight, putting your party down nine, at one point to 19 points, reform up one to 15 points, behind Labour on 44 points? We're looking at margin of error nearly, aren't we, in the difference in polls between reform and Conservatives. Are you worried and what should the PM do about it? 
Yes, I have seen that. And, and yes, of course, I am worried. They are very um, troubling figures for Conservatives. I think, of course, in the first past the post system in a general election, it doesn't quite work out like that. The Conservative vote will be spread differently to the reform vote. And whilst uh, the reform vote may be enough to stop Conservatives winning particular seats, probably quite a lot of seats, uh, the effect of it will, uh, will be to allow in uh, Labour MPs. So that's what the reform vote uh, will do. Um, but yes, of course, it is worrying. Uh, and I think it, it shows very much that we need to be leaning into these issues of immigration that people are so concerned about, economic security, those kind of issues that, that did win us the election in 2019, uh, that Boris Johnson very much stood for. And the only route back uh, to victory for the Conservatives is to lean into those issues that voters so very much care about. And I think the reform uh, polling, um, of course, not to take away from them as a party, they're a legit legitimate political party, but a lot of the polling for reform stems from a frustration with the Conservatives rather than necessarily a desire to see a reform government, because I think we both, we, we, we understand that under our current system, that's just not, not going to happen. It's interesting, Miriam, when you say leaning into the issues that won that 80 seat majority in 2019, which now must seem like an eternity ago to you. Um, look, the, the information is even more sobering. Leave voters are preferring reform over the Conservatives 33% to 32. Um, in England, reform 17, Tories 19, just two points behind. In the North, reform have overtaken the Conservatives, and particularly um, only 46% of Tory voters from 2019 are going to stick with the Tories. You're also losing the working classes and the over 65s. This is the red wall made flesh, as it were. This is how you won their last time. It's a time to reach out to those voters and turn this around, Miriam. As a Conservative MP, I very much hope so. And um, yes, the polling is is very worrying for us. Uh, it's it, you know we are polling as low as we ever have. But there are also an extraordinary number of people who are saying they don't know and haven't decided. And for this point in the electoral cycle, that is quite surprising. Uh, and of course, it you know it means we've got an enormous job to do to win those voters back. But what is significant is we're not seeing huge numbers of switches from Conservative to Labour, which shows I think that there's no real passion for a Keir Starmer government. Whilst people might be upset with us, there's no real passion for Labour. But it's also what is significant about that is in 2017 and 2019, lots of people in areas like the one that I represent voted Conservative for the first time. They voted Labour all their lives. Their parents and their grandparents had voted Labour all their lives. And the fact that they broke with that tribal vote, if you like, was very significant. And I think that's why we're not seeing such a rush back to Labour. But nevertheless, it's it does show what an extraordinary job we have got to do to win back people's confidence, to win back that lent vote, if you like, again. And obviously, reform are very much picking up uh, the votes of people who don't think we've done that yet. OK, Miriam Cakes, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for your candour and your honesty as ever. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, we can hear now from Home Secretary James Cleverley on the WASPy scandal and the Rwanda plan. Report has just come out. Obviously, the government will uh, look at the findings and the recommendations of that report. I'm not in a position where I can comment uh, on the on the details of it. But of course, we should remember that because of the actions that the government has taken with the triple lock, pensioners are £900 a year better off. That matches the £900 a year the average family will benefit from from the two cuts in national insurance contributions. We want people, whether they're retired or in work, to have more money in their pocket. That's why we're reducing the taxes, protecting pensions. That's why we're uh, uh, making sure that the management of the economy remains one of our priorities in government. And will you really get flights off the ground by the spring? Well, I am absolutely determined to get the legislation through the House to prevent Labour peers continually, continually delaying and obstructing what I am trying to do, what the government's trying to do, to break the business model of these criminal smuggling gangs, to deter people making those dangerous crossings across the Channel, to protect our borders and to stop the boats. Great. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. And that was Home Secretary James Cleverly earlier. And thank you to Chris Hope for joining me in the studio. A superb political start to the hour. Now, there's still plenty of time to grab our spring prizes in the Great British Giveaway. And that's a shopping spree, a gadget bundle, and an incredible £12,345, one, two, three, four, five quid, tax free. 
You've got to be in it to win it. And here's how you get your claws on the dosh. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Great stuff. Now, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent. And it's fair to say that our economics and business editor Liam Halligan thinks that's the wrong call. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. Should we put tobacco-style warnings on ultra-processed foods? Boris Johnson is calling on the government to do this. In this Daily Mail column, the former prime minister says that people don't know what they're feeding their families and there's too many extra ingredients. That's why I'm asking, should we put tobacco-style warnings on ultra-processed food? Well, joining me now to discuss, Steve Miller, former presenter of Fat Families, Helena Davidson, campaigner and policy expert at the Vegan Society. Right, so I'm going to start with you, Steve Miller. What do you think? Oh, I'm applauding Boris today. Good on you, mate. Uh, and the reason for that is we know that the research on uh, cigarette, you know, the warnings on cigarettes, I should say, when those warnings were visual, they worked very well. The second reason on a practical level is that we need to start stop looking and listening before we start, you know, grazing and putting mm. things in the trolley. And the third thing is that you know, these kind of signs or these warnings, I should say, are kind of hypnotic. They trigger the emotion. So they're much more likely to get people to think and, and maybe resist. Yeah, so the, at the Vegan Society, we're broadly in favour of increasing consumer knowledge um, when it comes to the nutri nutritional value of people's food. Um, but I think it's important to mention that ultra processed food isn't an issue that's exclusive to vegans. And whilst most meat alternatives will fall into the ultra processed food category, it largely depends on how we're going to look at how UPFs are going to be assessed because vegan um, alternatives that are fall under ultra processed foods, they're actually on average healthier than meat products or ultra processed foods that contain animal products. Really? So I think it depends on how we look at it. We might have to take a closer look at the nutritional profile of individual foods rather than the level of processing. I'm Andrew Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, 4.25 is the time. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Later this hour, I bring you the shock news that as Brits are happier than Germans. Well, all I can say is it must be really blooming miserable in the fatherland in Germany.
And before that, the economy is not yet at the point where rates can be lowered, but timings are moving in the right direction, says Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey earlier today. And this comes as this morning, the Bank of England held the base rate at 5.25% for the fifth consecutive time. Well, what does this mean for you? Well, here to break it down, it's GB News' business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, welcome to the show. Always an absolute pleasure. So they held firm, they stayed steady, but it's fair to say, Liam, you'd have liked to have seen a bit more flair from them. Explain to us. Indeed, Martin. So the Bank of England has held interest rates at five and a quarter percent, as you said. This is the base rate, which affects all the other lending rates in the economy. Base rates have been at five and a quarter percent since last August. It's a 16-year high. And while savers like the fact that interest rates are relatively high, uh, those of us with mortgages and personal loans and so on, when rates are high, that means we have to pay more to service those loans. So the Bank of England did keep interest rates at 5.25%. That wasn't unexpected. Interest rates have been creep, have crept up very steadily since the end of the COVID pandemic. You can see there, during the COVID lockdown, they were ultra low, just a quarter of 1%. And then they went up 15 consecutive times as the Bank of England tried to fight the inflation that happened after COVID lockdown ended as prices ballooned. Yesterday, we learnt that inflation was down at 3.4% during the year to February, but that's still quite a lot higher than the Bank of England's 2% target. Having said that, Martin, I do think the Bank of England should have cut interest rates anyway today, because the direction of travel of inflation is very much down. You have all those rate increases you just saw on that graph there. Still, they, they take time to feed through. And, you know, the economy is flatlining. There's almost no growth. And given the fact that inflation is on its way down, I think the Bank of England could have got ahead of the curve, if you like, having been slow to see that inflation was coming a couple of years ago, it's now determined to show everybody how vigilant it is against inflation. So it's taking far too long to start lowering rates in order to try and rebuild its credibility. I think that's a mistake, and a lot of people struggling with their mortgages will also think that's a mistake. And so what would you like to have seen instead, putting your reporting hat, hat to one side now, your opinion hat? You've been saying for a long time, Liam, you'd like to see the interest rates nibbled down to give us some fiscal stimulus and encourage us back to a healthier economy. That's right. When you lower interest rates, it does stimulate the economy uh, because it means people uh, don't have to pay so much to borrow money to invest or, or to spend. It gets the economy moving and crikey, do we need to get this economy moving? One person who really thinks we do, of course, is the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who has been hoping that the Bank of England would start cutting interest rates so it can get three or four interest rate cuts in before the next general election, which is probably going to be in September or October. I don't think that's now going to happen. I think the fact that the Monetary Policy Committee on the Bank of England, they voted by eight votes to one, Martin, to hold rates... It's going to be hard to reverse that mm. kind of opinion in the committee in one or two months. So I don't think we're going to get an interest rate cut in April either or probably even in May. June is probably the first interest rate cut based on current evidence. Though, of course, it's a very, very fast-moving situation. So, look, this isn't bad news uh, that interest rates were held at 5.25%, but it just isn't good news if you've got a mortgage. But the Bank of England is now signalling rates are going to come down soon. As you said in your introduction, it, Andrew Bailey, the governor, said inflation is now definitely moving in the right direction and was even hinting at rate cuts. The US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, has been hinting the same. And the Swiss Central Bank, earlier today, it actually did cut rates. It became one of the first major central banks in the world to cut rates. So the global interest rate cycle, if you like, is definitely on the turn and that really means a lot for those of us here in the UK with mortgages and personal loans, because that makes it more likely that the Bank of England will feel under pressure to get a move on and also cut rates here in the UK. 
Superb, Liam Halligan, always on the money and always superb to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Now, we're the People's Channel, so we've been out and about today to find out what the good people of Hull think about the decision not to cut that interest rate. Me personally, it doesn't mean too much because I've got a private pension as well as an old age pension, but it concerns me about the elderly who are just on old age pensions because uh, uh, that affects them quite a lot, and young families as well, you know, particularly single parents um, and people on mortgages as well in particular. It's not really, you don't really get much if you think about it, if you look in your bank and you f look at it, it's not really that much because you've got your bills to pay. And if you've got like debts or anything to pay, that's just then going to go, so you're not going to see it in the benefit. Well, it's better because I've got a savings account, so that'll go up, but otherwise, it's just rubbish, isn't it? Really. <laughs> It's just rubbish, isn't it? Well, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock. In a few minutes, I'll discuss the news that more and more kids are missing out on their school. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The headlines this hour, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent for the fifth time in a row. The bank's governor, Andrew Bailey, saying the economy has not yet got to the point where rates can be lowered, but he said things are moving in the right direction. Inflation itself is expected to fall slightly below 2% by the summer, but the conflict in the Middle East and disruption to the world's shipping lanes in the Red Sea has posed material risks, he said, to prices surging once again. Number 10 has said today it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number so far this year. And today, at least another 300 migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats. The Home Secretary, James Cleverly, says he's determined to deliver on his pledge to stop the boats. I am absolutely determined to get the legislation through the House to prevent Labour peers continually, continually delaying and obstructing what I am trying to do, what the government's trying to do, to break the business model of these criminal smuggling gangs, to deter people making those dangerous crossings across the Channel, to protect our borders and to stop the boats. James Cleverly. Now, the Queen has said King Charles is doing very well. She was speaking during a visit to Belfast today and handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband as well. Meanwhile, the King himself has been meeting the new High Commissioners from Tanzania and Singapore at Buckingham Palace in London. Those are the latest news stories. For the top stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Superb as ever. Now, a shocking report has revealed that the number of severely absent pupils has soared by an astonishing 133.6% since the pandemic. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional male breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue, and they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because 
you know, when hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo yeah. homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to show you this a hospital. This is the necessary. University yeah, Hospital do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, just aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> Yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yep. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than... It's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.37. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, the number of unauthorised pupil absences from schools in England increased during the last academic year. And let's look at some of the numbers. They're astonishing. The unauthorised absence rate rose from 2.1% in 2021-22 to 2.4% for the next 12 months. And this is nearly double the rate of 1.4% during 2018-19, which was the last school year, of course, before the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 150,000 people pools in England were severely absent during the 2022-23 year, and that means they missed more than 50% of possible school sessions, 21.2% of pupils in England, and that's around 1.57 million young people, were persistently absent during that school year. And that means they missed 10% or more of their school sessions. Feels like an epidemic of absenteeism. And I'm joined now by Beth Prescott, who's the Education Lead at the Centre for Social Justice. Welcome to the show, Beth. Very, very concerning figures. A lot of us were very concerned during lockdowns. A lot of children were simply losing the bond, simply breaking the habit of going to school. And Beth, I know my missus is a TA. The kids impacted often those at the bottom, those with special educational needs, those who are already behind. This is a deeply worrying trend. Explain to us what's going on. Yeah, so what we've seen today in the latest data released today is that in summer term 2023, severe absence, which is where a child misses 50% or more of their school time, they are absent while they are present, has hit new record levels with just under 158 thousand severely absent children in that summer term as well persistent absence which had kind of gone down a little bit on the previous term um, has ticked back up again with over 1.6 million children persistently absent so missing 10 percent or more of their school time in 2023 i think this is just showing the continued impact that school closures are having on our children 
And Beth, figures came out yesterday. It's even worse in Scotland. In Scotland now, attendance rate is only 90.2%. That means 9.8% of kids in Scotland are persistently missing school. That's damning an entire generation, isn't it? I think it's just becoming clearer and clearer the impact that school closures has had on our children. And like you mentioned earlier in your introduction around that, that kind of link between school and home, and the CSJ did some polling um, at the end of last year where we found that 28% of parents, that's parents, not just adults, of parents, believe that the pandemic showed it's not essential to attend school every day. So what we really need to see is the rebuilding of that relationship between schools and between parents and families. And that's why we at the Centre for Social Justice are calling for a national parental participation strategy to really rebuild that relationship and help schools and families engage more meaningfully with each other. It's a laudable aim, Beth, but don't you feel that a lot of the problem is that the parents themselves don't have a great bond with school or they may have had a bad educational experience themselves. I saw that a lot in the work I did with disadvantaged working class lads in particular who don't have that bond. Their parents aren't engaged. So very attentive middle class parents. That's not the problem. But how do you reach those stubborn parents who just feel that education isn't for their children? We conducted an inquiry last year to kind of try and really understand in depth the reasons that were driving these shocking increases in school absence. We uncovered a number of factors. At the top of that, definitely what we were told consistently was anxiety and mental health, uh, both for the child, but also perhaps in the home as well. And also we did hear around that kind of just general disengagement with the school curriculum, particularly where perhaps a parent had a negative experience of school. That's but all in all, what we heard is that kind of the reasons behind absence are often complex, are often multifaceted, individualised. And that's what we want to see in the response to the absence crisis by rolling out 2,000 attendance mentors nationwide. We'll work directly with the families to build up that relationship and understand the reasons why that child is absent, the reasons within that family, and then help remove those underlying barriers. And Beth, what about fining the parents? I mean, we've seen there's, there's evidence here upping the fines from 60 quid to 80 quid. Those fines, of course, double if you don't pay them within, 120, within 12 days, beg your pardon. And that is oftentimes when parents are taking their kids out to go on holiday. It's getting tough financially, a route you might pursue. Our concern is that the blanket use of fines might perversely incentivise parents to kind of take their children off the school all together if they're kind of struggling, you know, with, with many of these issues that can lead to, to school absence. And what we really need is a support first approach that kind of really gets to grips with the issues underlying this absence crisis and works to resolve those and support these children to get back into school. And yet, you know, full disclosure, I must say, I have taken my kids out of school to go on holiday because Holidays are so expensive during the holiday periods. A lot of parents, particularly who are on the breadline, are thinking, well, OK, it's a, it's a 60 quid fine, but the, the cost of the holiday is double during the, the break times. So a, a lot of people are taking this option through financial necessity. I think it just shows, again, that I need a real comprehensive response that kind of gets to grips with the full absence crisis and, and all the reasons that are driving it. Whereas at the moment, whereas ministers have taken some steps, it's just kind of tinkering around the edges and not really kind of dealing with the full extent of the crisis. We need a response from ministers that matches the scale of this increasing crisis. OK, great stuff. Thanks for joining us. And that's Beth Prescott, who's the education lead at the Centre for Social Justice. Fascinating stuff. Now, GB News has been given exclusive access to a police raid where thousands of pounds worth of narcotics were seized. Dramatic stuff. We'll have that soon. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. Uh, tonight, we've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of Southern England, East Anglia will stay uh, dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow. And some very gusty winds, a very windy night across Northern Scotland.
It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers, though, also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. And very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday, we'll see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. The time is 4.47. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News. At five o'clock, I get reaction to the news that more than 800 migrants have crossed the channel since yesterday morning alone. Now, thousands of pounds worth of narcotics were seized in a dawn raid in London yesterday as the Metropolitan Police target sophisticated drug dealing groups. In a broadcast exclusive, GB News' Ray Anderson was asked to ride along and film a rather rude awakening. Daybreak in Hillingdon, northwest London. And an alleged drug dealer is about to get an unexpected wake up call from the Met. Inside the flat is a 29 year old male suspect who police believe is part of a network distributing narcotics to over 100 people. For the Met, this is just the latest arrest in Operation Yamata, a London-wide crackdown where specialist teams target sophisticated drug-dealing groups. Detective Chief Inspector Erin Kerr is in charge. And we would call him the, um, the controller of this network. So he's the one that's operating uh, this line. He controls this line, he owns this line. They are often the men of violence, so they're not just known for drug supply, but they're known for a lot of other um, violent offences that impact the community. Back inside the flat in the living room, PCs Anna Harwood and Kevin McLean have found what appears to be Class A drugs. That looks like crack cocaine. About an ounce, probably. They say the crack alone has a street value of almost £3,000. This is heroin, I believe. It's been divided up into individual wraps and wraps ready for homeward supply to the end users. Um, this is cling film. These are the brown Rizzler papers that are used to wrap 
uh, the heroin cling films used to wrap the crack. Uh, this is going to be the heroin. So that would have made into that. This would eventually have been broken down using the scales. It was just all being done on this table. And then obviously we found the drug line that used to send out the bog messages. PC McLean warns the heroin could be laced with nitazines, a deadly synthetic opioid outlawed by the government just this week. Uh, basically they're like 100 times stronger than like morphine and fentanyl. Basically when the heroin's laced with it, they're, yeah, they're like lethal. With this latest arrest under Operation Yamata, officers believe they've taken down the final connection in a London drugs line that's been operating for years and thousands of pounds of Class A narcotics are off the streets. Police say the suspect was arrested on suspicion of supplying Class A drugs and remains in custody for questioning. But until that news filters down to the streets, his suspected drug line will keep ringing off the hook. Ray Addison, GB News. Great stuff from Ray Addison there. Now, a story that caught my eye earlier is that for the first time in seven years, get this. Britons feel happier than Germans for the first time in seven years. As I just said, an international study has found the UK was ranked 20th, four places above our German friends in the World Happiness Report 2024, and it lists 143 countries by their happiness levels. This comes as early this month, if you recall. The UK was listed as the second most miserable nation in the world, according to the Mental um, well-being index. Now, take them with a pinch of salt. One says we're the second most miserable. The other says we're actually happier than the Germans. Now, the overriding response to this online has been, crikey, it must be bad in Germany. I mean, if they're more depressed than us, what's going on over there? And what's really interesting when you drill into the details is, is that Germans believe that Britons have a greater sense of freedom and believe their country is less corrupt. Now, the top ranking nations for happiness are the Nordic nations. Finland is top, followed by Denmark, Iceland, Sweden. Interestingly, Israel is next on the list. You wouldn't think they'd be particularly happy at the moment. Or they're being brought together by the conflict. I mean, after all, if you remember back, Britain was at its happiest, many say, when we were at war. We had a sense of national purpose, national identity, a cohesiveness that brought us closer together in our hour of need, in our darkest hours. Interestingly, younger people are more miserable across the shop, across the European continent and across America, driven by the fact they can't afford a house, wages are stagnating and the high cost of living. A lot of young people say, what's the point? What's the point getting on the career ladder when there's nothing in it for me? And by the way, Afghanistan was at the bottom, which I guess is understandable. Now, got hundreds and hundreds of emails coming from you. And the one thing that's really got you going is this so-called migration emergency called by Rishi Sunak. An emergency, which we found out earlier on, gave MPs an early duck off for Easter. Now, it's what you're saying about this. Karen says this, I'm absolutely furious that the Prime Minister rewards his party with an early finish for Easter when the country is in such disarray. Now, Miriam Cates, the Tory MP, told us that's now been changed. They are being whipped back into line on Monday. I think only in response to the fact that this has leaked out. Shirley says this, many of us voted to leave the European Union because we did not want to be controlled by unelected members of the EU. So why is it now that the unelected members of the House of Lords can overturn the wishes of the MPs for whom we voted? Robert adds this, this current government has not got a clue what they are doing. But what really bothers me is I don't think we're going to see much better from the Labour Party. And Laura adds this, the immigration situation has yet again made the United Kingdom an international laughing stock. Richard says this, Rishi Sunak, what a surprise, we have a migration emergency. That's because you promised to stop the boats. You have lied to us and failed. Raymond finishes on this corking point. There will be no migrant crisis if the current Prime Minister was more like Maggie Thatcher or Winston Churchill. 
So that's all for this hour, but stay with me um, as I'll be putting the Tory story in Rwanda plan to a former Labour MP next, asking whether he thinks flights will ever get off the ground. Do you think they will ever get off the ground? Don't forget, we've got single pint of beer as a bet with the Prime Minister, and I think our beer's good. I'm Martin Dorby, this is GB News, but here's your weather with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. Uh, tonight, we've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of Southern England, East Anglia will stay uh, dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow, and some very gusty winds, a very windy night across northern Scotland. It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers. They're also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. And very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday will see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. Thank you for your company. It's 5 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster and all across the UK today. Rishi Sunak may have promised to stop the boats, and the government has now said we're going through a migration emergency. But its flagship Rwanda bill has been delayed yet again, and it won't be debated again in the Commons before Easter. Does that sound like an emergency to you? To add to the pressure on the Prime Minister, a massive 514 migrants crossed the Channel yesterday alone. And more have arrived today, taking the total to over 800. Now, that does sound like a migration emergency. Next, state pension uproar. Thousands of women stand affected as the Department for Work and Pensions are accused of a failure to inform a change to the state's pension age and have footballers gone soft? I think we know the answer to that. Rumour has it that England are planning to take their own scent, their own pong aftershave to the Euros. They're giving a whole new meaning to football crazy. That's all coming in your next hour. And on that note, it's Brian Clough. Would have been Brian Clough's 89th birthday today. One of my absolute heroes, old Big Ed, 89 he'd been today. What have he made of this? Uh, players have run their own pong. Get a grip. I'm talking about getting a grip. Get in touch if you're feeling exasperated about this so-called migration emergency. What emergency? If it takes a month to sort out, if I had a leak in my kitchen and it took a month to sort out, I would say, that's not an emergency. That's an eternity. And we've seen 800 coming across the channel in the past two days. Now, that does feel like an emergency. Yet we found out at three o'clock in this show, MPs were cheering when they'd been given an early break, an early cut to go back home and take an extended break off. Does that sound like an emergency? But number 10 got in touch with us saying that's not the case. They will be back debating this and it will get royal assent later in April. Full details on that coming up. So you're watching the show and so are the powers that be in number 10. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent for the fifth time in a row today. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey saying the economy wasn't yet quite at the point where rates could be lowered, but said things are moving in the right direction. The people of Hull have been telling GB News what the latest interest rate figure means to them and their lives. But it concerns me about the elderly who are just on old age pensions because uh, uh, that affects them quite a lot. And young families as well, you know, particularly single parents. You don't really get much if you think about it. If you look in your bank and you look at it, it's not really that much because you've got your bills to pay. And if you've got like debts or anything to pay, that's just then going to go. So you're not going to see it in the benefit. I've been working in hospitality, which isn't the best, the best industry for an income. Um, so I was struggling, I was struggling to keep afloat, and therefore I've had to, had to move back in with my parents up here. Now, thousands of women in their, in, born in the 1950s may be eligible for compensation after a report found that the Department for Work and Pensions failed to adequately inform them that the state pension age was going to change. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman looked at potential injustices resulting from the decision to raise women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's back in 2010. But the Women Against State Pension Inequality campaign, known as WASPI, is suggesting there should be around £10,000 in compensation for each woman, claiming they weren't properly warned about the changes and that caused them financial hardship after being unable to plan for their futures. The new report suggests they should receive a payout, though, of between one and £3,000. The Shadow Home Secretary, Vet Cooper, says it is important to take the report seriously.
I think this is a really important issue because many women across the country just feel like they had the goalposts moved from them at the time when they didn't know what was changing. And so that's why I think it's really important that we look at this report. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that people will be looking really seriously at it. Well, the WASPy chair, Angela Madden, says she's pleased with the news so far. Three years ago, in July 21, the Ombudsman agreed with us that the DWP had got it seriously wrong and maladministered the changes to the state pension age. Um, not ever so happy with the suggestions he's made to the government, but I'm really glad that he's laid the paper before the government because I think it needs to be debated in the House. In other news today, number 10 has said it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number so far this year in one day. And today, at least another 300 migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats. The Home Secretary, James Cleverly, says he's determined to deliver on the government's pledge to stop the boats. I am absolutely determined to get the legislation through the House to prevent Labour peers continually, continually delaying and obstructing what I am trying to do, what the government's trying to do, to break the business model of these criminal smuggling gangs, to deter people making those dangerous crossings across the Channel, to protect our borders and to stop the boats. Meanwhile, a South Sudanese man has been jailed for piloting a dangerously overcrowded small boat as it made its way across the English Channel last August. 31-year-old Hul Farm Marker was caught steering the vessel with 52 migrants balanced on board, many of whom were forced to perch dangerously on each side. The Home Office has released a series of images taken by Border Force officials off the overcrowded boat. Channel 4 says their investigation into the allegations against the comedian Russell Brand have found no evidence that its managers were aware of sexual allegations against him. In September, the 48-year-old was accused of rape, assault and emotional abuse after a joint investigation by the broadcaster and the Times and Sunday Times. Mr Brand has strongly denied all the accusations against him iPhone maker Apple has been accused in the United States courts of monopolising the smartphone market. In the case against Apple, brought by the US Justice Department, it alleges that the company used its control of the iPhone to illegally limit competitors and consumer options. Apple has denied the claims and vowed to vigorously fight it. Four environmental protesters have pleaded not guilty to criminal damage at the Prime Minister's home. The Greenpeace activist draped Rishi Sunak's constituency home in Yorkshire with anti-oil and gas banners last year. Each of the accused denied charges of criminal damage to roof slates after the group was pictured sitting on the Prime Minister's roof whilst he was away on holiday. The two-day trial will start in July. And the Queen has said His Majesty King Charles is doing very well. She was on a visit to Belfast today and handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband, who's undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King himself has been meeting the new High Commissioners for Tanzania and Singapore at a ceremony today at Buckingham Palace in London. Those are the latest news stories. Do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now we start with the latest on the Rwanda bill. And Rishi Sunak has suffered yet another blow to his flagship legislation. The government lost seven votes as peers moved to water down the Prime Minister's hardline deportation plan. And MPs won't debate the legislation again, can you believe this, until after Easter. Meanwhile, 514 migrants crossed the channel yesterday, making it the busiest day of migrant arrivals so far this year. And more have made the crossing today, we believe now taking the total nearer to 800. 
Well, I'm joined now by GB News political editor Christopher Hope. Chris, welcome back. We started the show at three o'clock with the astonishing revelation that Conservative MPs were cheering, yeah. whooping with delight. Claimed by journalists outside the meeting room last night at the 1922 committee meeting. Uh, that's part of the story, not the full story. Certainly they were told that we're not going to try and get through the Rwanda bill next week as planned. Uh, instead, we're going to wait till after Easter so, you know, some of you can, can leave early if you want to. But we now know there's a third, there was a three-line whip for Monday, so MPs are expected back in to do a bit of work before they're off on, off on their extended uh, Easter break when they be, should be campaigning for the local elections, of course, or the mayoral elections. Uh, some others can be on holiday or go on, on trips and the rest. So that was the idea. But we have uh, had some uh, updates uh, through the programme. I've, I've had a phone call from a very senior person in government who's made clear the idea had been to give uh, the safety of Rwanda bill uh, royal assent on Thursday next week. But in fact, that's been delayed um, uh, until April the 18th, uh, because uh, according to the sources in the government, uh, Buckingham Palace is asking for longer to, uh, to sign off and give royal assent to acts of parliament. Um, entirely understandable, the king is being treated for cancer, he is doing government work, but this extended period is why they're targeting the April the 18th. I have, of course, gone to Buckingham Palace for comment on that. And the overriding sentiment, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of responses, many of which aren't even printable. No, have a go. <laughs> yeah. And that is, you know, what kind of emergency takes a month to well, solve? It's Rishi Sunak's problem. Back in November, he said, I'm going to bring you forward emergency legislation, get these flights taken off after the government won that Supreme Court battle. We all thought, right, here we go, we're going to see some kind of, like, like counter-terrorism legislation going through in 72 hours, both Houses of Parliament. Instead, it's taken the best part of four months by the time this gets through, if it is on through on April the 18th. The problem was, probably was going back to being calling it originally emergency legislation mm. when it hasn't been treated as such. It's gone through in the, in the regular three-month period of time it takes to go through. Today, in the House of Commons, in, in the briefing with the Prime Minister's official spokesman, they said they've got a, 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 a migration emergency on, which, of course, some would say, well, if you've got an emergency on, why can't you fix it quickly? Why wait weeks and weeks to fix the plumbing? Yeah, exactly. If there's, if there's an emergency flood, you'd be up to your neck in water. Maybe that's an, an ample metaphor for what's going on with this bill, which just feels doomed. And many people just don't have any faith in it now. And we Chris. did ask the government, are you taking us for fools? Are you taking viewers of GB News, readers of newspapers for fools by, by saying it's an emergency and then dragging your feet over it? They've been pretty clear that's not the case. They do know best to get it through. Had they rushed it through the House of Commons, it would have been got bogged down in the Lords, because they would then feel emboldened to give more scrutiny to legislation rushed through. So that's that's the explanation, but frankly, a four-month wait for an emergency is too long. Certainly is. Now, let's quickly have a dive into the polling out today. The Reform Party has gone up a percentile to 15%. The Conservatives down one to 19. Wow. And also delving into that, there are further discrepancies. Some of it says that Reform have overtaken the Conservatives in the North, gaining real traction with the working classes, the over 65s, died in the world, traditional Conservative voters. These numbers voters. are a huge worry for the government. Tories down 9 to 19 per cent, down one. Labour on 44 per cent. Reform up one at 15 per cent. We're getting near margin of error, plus or minus two per cent normally. So we're not there yet, but I, I can only imagine that Nigel Farage, uh, obviously colleague at GB News, also had a role in the past at Reform UK. Were he to see that, he must be sorely tempted to get back involved. Uh, if he certainly got involved, pollsters tell us that might add maybe five points to Reform's polling and take them past the Tory party. Which would be an astonishing moment indeed. If uh, the as things stand, he's undecided. Yeah, well, of course, he'll keep that cause. He's his cards close to his chest. Now, let's talk now to former Labour MP, Ivor Kaplan, who joins us now. Welcome to the show, Ivor. Thanks for joining us. So we have Good a migration afternoon. emergency, which our viewers are saying feels more like a migration eternity. Things moving at a snail pace, nothing is happening. But however, before the Labour Party get too complacent, Ivor, we spoke to Yvette Cooper this week on GB News. She told us of 1,000 enforcement and returns officers is the Labour Party's plan, but it's got to be said there's not a great deal of faith out there that any party can solve what is now becoming a national emergency. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm not sure it's an emergency in, in, uh, in how the House of Commons operates. Three, four, five months to, for a piece of legislation is what I would regard as normal. I think Christopher was just saying something pretty similar. Uh, on that in, in respect of this legislation. 
it, th there's always then going to be this clash between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It happened when we were in government and uh, and many uh, conservative lords were very happy to be doing that and delaying bills as they went through. So none of this is new. That's the point. What What is happening is that the some of the details of uh, the bill are obviously making it more difficult. And there, I think there are seven or eight areas that uh, the, ho the House of Commons and the House of Lords can't agree on. And in that respect, to, 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 you know, to take another month to get things right is probably a good thing. Personally, I don't think this is going to work at all. Um, it's a lot of money. It's going to cost literally over a five-year period billions of pounds. And I think there are better things that uh, we could be doing both to solve this, the, the longer-term issue of, of how we work with the French and the, the money would not then be spent uh, widely on, on just this issue when there are so many things that uh, a, a potentially a new government, if that's Labour or the Conservatives, will need to look at. Ivor, it's Chris Hope in the studio here with Martin. Um, are Hi, you Chris. happy? Hi. Are you happy with the unelected peers frustrating the will of the House of Commons, the will of Parliament to do this? If you were in government, you'd be spitting tax. Instead, you're kind of meekly sort of defending the indefensible, some would say. No, not at all. Not at all, Chris. I've been in that position with legislation myself when I was a minister. So I know what, what it's about. Uh, you can't always expect just things to ride your way. And actually, uh, quite often, the House of Lords do raise serious issues that, uh, from a ministerial point of view, actually help the piece of the legislation to actually be better than what might be the case. So uh, I, I just think this is normal. This is normal practice in what is going on. But I can understand why why people say they think it's an emergency and all that sort of thing. But the legislation itself was never emergency legislation, uh, as we would do in in terrorism issues, for instance. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Former Labour MP Ivor Kaplan, thanks for joining us. Many people will be Pleasure. thinking, Chris, that the House of Lords, they were the Brexit blockers, and now are they the Rwanda wreckers? I mean, Ivor makes a the point. They are trying to improve it. There's a revising chamber. That's the point of it. Um, but the, the urgency, really, is on the government side. They had a long time to think about what to do if they lost the Supreme... The, the, or they won the Supreme Court uh, uh, action. We, we, we were led to believe there was an oven-ready bill to go straight out of the House of Commons, get it into the Lords, and it's been delayed or, or apparently taking far longer than we thought it might do. If there's an emer emergency on, then why not show us it looks like one? Exactly right. Chris Hope, always superb as ever. Thank you very much. Now it's time now for the great British giveaway. We've got a shopping spree, a God and Gadget bundle and £12,345. One, two, three, four, five quid. Tax free in cash. And here's all the details you need to get your mitts on that money. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Gay get stuck in. Now, thousands of women stand affected as the Department for Work and Pensions is accused of a failure to inform a change to the state pension age. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. This is GB News.
Britain's News Channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, really well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through. We've followed them and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine. He's, he's, he's on his phone um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the... the the sort of the emergency crew in panic thinking he's going to sink um so we could not just sit there and watch um he's absolutely terrified yeah poor bloke well done you do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad it is because although i do sympathize with them they are so red taped but surely sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 5.22. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, Brits in North East England will pay hundreds more in council tax than those living in the capital in London. But why on earth is this the case? And we get the latest on all things royal as Queen Camilla was told well wishes that the King is doing very well during her visit to Belfast. Now, women born in the 1950s are owed compensation after being hit by the state pension age change. A report suggests that women should receive a payout of between £1,000 and £2,950 as the Ombudsman looks at potential injustices after the decision to raise women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's. And here's what members of the great British public thought of today's announcement. I mean, if, if they've lost years of pension then I think it should be whatever they've lost, plus compensation on top of that, just like the post office. Well, I had an argument with my wife this morning, because she's a waspy, <laughs> and I said, you wanted equality, you've got equality, don't argue, but that didn't, didn't go down very well, I'm afraid. Well, they hope they get it, and they hope they get it more. They deserve it. Yeah, six years. I mean, men only had a year. What's the difference? They still go up to work, don't they? So, no, I didn't agree with it at all. <laughs> So there we go, a divided public. And the bloke there probably might be um, serving his own dinner when he gets home to his missus later on. Joining us now is Helen Morrissey from the Head of Retirement Analysis. Welcome to the show, Helen. Always a pleasure. So for those who've been campaigning for years, this is a huge victory. But we heard earlier, Helen, this could cost the taxpayer up to £10 billion. Is this the right thing? And can we afford to do it? 
Well, I mean, this this has been an ongoing issue for a really, really long time. The WASPy women have been really, really pushing to have this issue kind of recognised. Now, what the Ombudsman um, report has shown is that, you know, how these changes were communicated to these women has meant that they have suffered loss. And actually, if you look at the wording of the report, they're pretty punchy about it, you know, saying that the DWP needs to apologise to these women and to put some kind of redress in place. Now, you are right, it is going to cost a lot of money. Um, we have a very cash-strapped government right now. It's not going to be, you know, what they want to see. Um, but, you know, the, the Ombudsman's report is pretty unequivocal in its findings about how these women were communicated with and the effect that it's had. And Helen, we have the post office scandal, we have the infected blood scandal, and now we have this. And it makes you wonder if a future Labour government will commit to even going down this route. That's a lot of expensive bills to be paying out. We're £2.6 trillion in national debt. Well, this, this is the big challenge, isn't it? Because the Ombudsman has made its it recommendations, but the government is not legally bound to accept those findings. And the the Ombudsman has kind of been quite open in saying that they don't expect the government to look to implement a compensation arrangement for these women. And I think that, you know, there is a lot of pressure on government to do something, to say something about this. But as you say, the likelihood is, is that any compensation scheme is going to take a while to kind of put together, if they put it together at all. And it's likely to be a problem for whoever wins the next election. Superb stuff. Thanks for joining us. That's Helen Morrissey from the Head of Retirement Analysis. You can see on your screen there some of those WASPy demonstrators. I, I, I often used to chat to them. They just around the corner from the studio here. And what I mentioned, well, what about um, having the same um, pension age as men? Isn't that a quality? Needless to say, it didn't go down very well at all. Now, a spokesman for the Department for Work and Pensions has said this. We will consider the Ombudsman's report and respond in due course, having cooperated fully throughout this investigation. The government has always been committed to supporting all pensioners in a sustainable way that gives them a dignified retirement whilst also being fair to them and taxpayers. The state pension is the foundation of income in retirement and will remain so as we deliver a further 8.5% rise in April, which will increase the state pension for 12 million pensioners by £900. Now, Brits in North East England will pay hundreds of pounds more than those living in the capital, London. A survey says people in poorer areas will have to fork out more than those living in wealthier southern regions. And I thought we were supposed to be about levelling up, not levelling down. Does this show that we are still a very London-centric council, especially when it comes now to council tax? Well, joining me now is the CEO of Taper Plus and North East resident, Aman Chahal. Welcome to the show, Aman. A lot of people will be looking at these figures today and absolutely scratching their heads and saying for a, a band D property in the North East of England, you'll now be paying more for the same property worth much more money in London. How on earth is this happening and how does that make you feel as a resident of the North East? I'm sure Martin, no one in the North East is happy about paying more council tax. But I think we need to um, remember that council tax hasn't been re-evaluated or reformed in over 30 years. So it's something that's well overdue. And um, we do have a higher percentage of low value homes in the North East. So that has made an impact. Yeah, but when you look at the numbers, I mean, how is it even fair that you'd be paying £240 more than a property in London? People, you say you've got lower price houses. That is, of course, true. But also you have lower wages and therefore the net impact on people in the North House, North East, beg your pardon, is a double whammy. A lot of people will be looking at this and thinking... Is this country really about levelling up or is this all about taking care of the poncers in London? Pardon my French. I think um, it's important that to remember that the North East does have a lot going for it. Housing is cheaper. Salaries are going up all the time. And as a company with who's involved in specialist building products, we've got a choice to remain in the North East. And we choose to do that because there's skills, infrastructure and support available. So as long as the, the money is, remains in the North East, I don't think anyone will have an issue with it, Martin. Um, we certainly don't want to be like the people in Birmingham, who we have an office in Wolverhampton, and Birmingham's just next door. 
and their council's going bust. So as long as it keeps being invested in the northeast, I don't think there'll be an issue. But are you seeing this money being wisely spent? We hear all the time about terrible pothole issues, about a crumbling of, of servicers locally. Are you happy in the North East with what you're seeing for the return on your council tax? We are certainly seeing a lot of levelling up, Martin, and it has had a, a big impact. Um, we've seen the railway. The railways have been improved, so transport links have improved. Um, Connectivity has improved massively. And um, it's just a great place to be. Well, that's very diplomatically put. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. And that's the CEO of Taper Plus and North East resident, Aman Chahal. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Now, it's fair to say, when I put this on social media earlier, there are a few more choice comments, shall we say, from those living up north to this. And there is a great feeling this country seems continually, whether it's council tax or whether it's on infrastructure, HS2, the expansion of the underground network, the Elizabeth Line, Crossrail. London seems to get all the bells and the whistles, all the baubles, all of the money, all of the TLC. And the regions often feel very, very left behind. I'm from the East Midlands. I'm from Nottingham. Where's all the improved transport there? Now, where is the East-West strength? Where is sorting out those areas? We were promised this at the last election. Do you feel the government has delivered in your region? Get in touch the usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com. Do you think that the politicians pay lip service to the regions and then during elections and then when it comes time to bring home the bacon, they're sadly absent. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock and I have the latest on that alleged data breach involving the Princess of Wales. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines. The headlines this hour, the Bank of England has held the interest rate at five and a quarter percent for the fifth time in a row. The Bank of England's Governor Andrew Bailey saying the economy isn't yet at the point where rates can be lowered. But things are moving, he said, in the right direction. Inflation is expected to fall slightly below 2% by the summer. But the conflict in the Middle East and the disruption to shipping in the Red Sea poses material risks, he said, to prices surging again. Number 10 has said it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 migrants were picked up by Border Force officials. That's the highest number so far this year. And today, at least another 300 illegal migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats. The Home Secretary, James Cleverly, said earlier he's determined to deliver on his pledge to stop the boats. I am absolutely determined to get the legislation through the House to prevent Labour peers continually, continually delaying and obstructing what I am trying to do, what the government's trying to do, to break the business model of these criminal smuggling gangs, to deter people making those dangerous crossings across the Channel, to protect our borders and to stop the boats. The Queen has said King Charles is doing very well. She was on a visit to Belfast meeting people there. Camilla was also handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband, who's still undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King has been meeting the new High Commissioners of Tanzania and Singapore in Buckingham Palace in London. That's your top stories. For the latest, sign up to GB News Alert. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Shall we take a quick look at the numbers then? Yes, the pound will buy you $1.2670 and €1 1.1663. The price of gold is £1,723.29 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today, leaving it at 7,882 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. So we've had loads and loads of emails in today. Two topics have really got you going, and that is this so-called 
immigration emergency over the Rwanda plan. Let's get stuck into some of those now. Michael says this. Why are Conservative MPs blaming the House of Lords, mainly Labour peers, of blocking Rwanda policy when there are more Tory peers in that chamber? No wonder so many Conservative voters are filled with apathy or jumping ship to other Party is fair point. There was a big shout out to try and get every Conservative peer across the land to turn up, but still they suffered a humiliating defeat. Dave adds this. It's simply time to, to declare a state of emergency. Now, that is a fair point. Now, Giorgio Maloney did that in Italy, and they, they simply turned the boats away. They wouldn't let them land in Italy. They had to land in France, cause an international outcry. She didn't care. She put her foot down and did it. Now, don't forget, Italy is in the ECHR, and it's still a member state of the, of the European Union. So the big question is, the will to do it doesn't seem to be there, let alone if you have a bill. Quick um, email here on pensions. Of course, the women's pension age ruling happened today. The Ombudsman saying women should deserve a payout. John says this, welcome news that the state pension owed to our hard-working women should be paid back. However, the government has said that due to the amount that is outstanding, it will not be able to make any repayments for the foreseeable future. And I'll have some more emails before the end of the show. Thank you very much for getting in touch. It's always appreciated. This is The People's Channel. Please get in touch. Now I'm about to talk all things royal with the biographer Angela Levin. There's so much to talk about in terms of royal matters. I'm Martin Dorbley on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase. You know what I mean? Like anyone who talks about anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right because that's what that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on the show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And oh, no, also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this she is she fingers to stuff, we, She's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean... even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an... One of the most important issues of our day. What well, did Labour playing out here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you say they won't. that, will they? Because they? you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <coughs> Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 5.39. We're on the final furlong. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the English football team will head to Germany this summer for the European Championships. And guess what? They'll be taking something special with them. You couldn't make it up. But before that, let's have a little roundup of all of the royal stories of the day. And Queen Camilla has told well wishes that the King is doing very well during a visit in Belfast today. And the King has also met with the new High Commissioners from Tanzania. Tanzania and Singapore, still keeping very busy, the pair of them. And Labour leader Sakir Starmer has voiced concerns about the intense public scrutiny around the Princess of Wales, telling people to butt out and leave her alone. And this comes, of course, after investigations continue into claims that up to three people at the London Clinic could have been involved in the alleged accessing of the Princess of Wales's private medical records. An astonishing story. Well, I'm joined now by royal commentator Angela Levin. Angela, always an absolute joy to see you and have you on the <laughs> show. Let's you. start. Let's start with this um, alleged data breach. If this is true, if this comes to pass, it's an absolute scandal, isn't it? Yes, I'm much more concerned with hearing the detail about that from the hospital than actually um, what's wrong with Princess Catherine. Um, we're pounding at her. Loads of people have been thoroughly nasty, making huge demands, but we're not hearing the same amount of demands, not the same determination to get it out of people um, from the hospital. They should be working extremely hard and we should know exactly what's going on because it's not just for uh, the princess, it's for anyone who goes into a hospital and doesn't want all the details um, to go around to anybody else. I think that's absolutely appalling, but we don't know. We don't know who has been um, sent away. We don't know what they're doing about it. I think that's what the most important thing is, because it also will um, relieve um, the princess to know that actually it's um, been sorted and she's not going to have people who are buying it for vast amounts of money and um, spreading it all over the country. Yeah, I think you raise a very good point there, Angela, because the, the notion that the conspiracy theorists, the gossip merchants online are, 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 are hypothesising about what may or may not be at play here with the princess, the fact, very fact, I mean, everybody's medical records should be totally sacrosanct and sacred and not a matter for public discourse or exposure. The fact this could be happening to a member of the royal family, the fact this could be happening to one of the, a, a medical clinic which treats royals, celebrities and luminaires is absolutely staggering. And ordinary people. I mean, I, you know, if I'd have gone there, I would feel that my, it would have to be secret about me. I mean, I think it's for everyone. It's extremely um, unpleasant thought. And let's talk a little bit now about, we've heard today that Kate is back to working from home. We hear that she's working on early years projects. And so therefore it seems, OK, not quite a full return to public facing duties yet, but seems to be on the mend. Yes. I mean, this is what they said um, when she, before she had the operation and then after the operation. I think this is something they're trying to put out to calm us down. Um, but she did, uh, it did say that she would, could be working even in bed if she wanted to, because it was something she really cared about. So I think that's probably possible, but I don't put too much on that. I think people should just leave her and, and wait and see. I, I don't like it when they make these demands. And actually, I've discovered that some of the people have done that, whose names are in the papers, but I don't want to mention them, 
are related or in some way or another with Meghan. And there's one who's been very um, fierce about her returning back and why isn't she? But he was in the um, Netflix um, Meghan and Harry production of Six Hours. And he's also said very rude things that um, the, the couple are getting very old and ugly. He said that before. He's mm. got a very spiteful way of attacking people. Um, and I think there are other people who are doing that, but they're not actually the public. I think that most of the public respect the royal family and how she works and how Prince William work and their sense of duty. Um, but they find little things that they can blow up and make it mm. all a terrible mess, which it is now. And I'm sure that it would hurt anyone who's trying to do a decent job um, to be talked about like that. Do you think, Angela, the royal family might look on this and think we might have been able to play this a bit better? Back in the day, of course, the paparazzi were treated as better the devil you know, give them access, let them have something, and then they'll go away and not badger you. Do you think they might look back and think we could have played this better? Yes, I'm sure they could. Actually, today there's an advert in a paper asking for a PR person who will uh, pay attention to detail. Um, unfortunately, the amount offered is 25,000 a year. So I don't expect they're going to get a top notch person. I think they could, should consider that because the PR that they need is very urgent and very important. Yeah, you think for 25 grand a year, Angela, you won't get the brightest button in the box, <laughs> will you? Uh, no. What about the Queen, um, Queen Camilla in Belfast um, putting best foot forward, looking splendid? Yes, yeah, she does look splendid. She's got the right colour green on and she's very friendly. She was a bit nervous in 2015 when she first went to Ireland and for a big lunch, one of these things that had at the, the various... Um, celebrations here and uh, she talked to all sort of people people who didn't like the monarchy people who didn't like the UK and everybody liked her because she's so natural and she's funny and she's really interested in people and you can see her doing this again she's very chatty she leans in towards them and smiles and says the funny things and she said that you know he's the uh, king charles was doing very well and she's trying to keep him in order you know i mean it's just very homely and it's very nice but it's hard work i mean she'll do three days away um they were both supposed to go there but of of course, King Charles can't do that now. So she wouldn't let it just um, be postponed. So she's gone there on her own to work incredibly hard, quietly, to make sure everything um, carries on as if nothing serious is happening. And I admire her for that hugely, really. Superb stuff. Thanks for joining us, Royal Commentator Angela Levin. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, a spokesman for the London Clinic has given us a statement, and it says this. Everyone at the London Clinic is acutely aware of our individual, professional, ethical and legal duties with regards to patients' confidentiality. We take enormous pride in the outstanding care and discretion we aim to deliver for all our patients that put their trust in us every day. We have systems in place to monitor management of patient information and in the case of any breach, all appropriate investigatory, regulatory and disciplinary steps will be taken. There is no place at our hospital for those who intentionally breach the trust of any of our patients or colleagues. Now, I couldn't believe this story when I read it this morning. England will take three special fragrances with them when they head to Germany this summer for Euro 2024. The final proof, they're a bunch of metrosexuals. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. 
uh, tonight. We've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of Southern England, East Anglia will stay uh, dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow and some very gusty winds. A very windy night across northern Scotland. It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers, though, also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. And very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday, we'll see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.51. I'm Martin Dormley. This is GB News. Now, today would have been Brian Clough's 89th birthday. Cloughy was a very special man to me. I was a young Not Nottingham Forest fan when he led us to one league title and two European Cups in a row. I was a ball boy for Cloughy when I was 11. He gave me a pound note and a pat on the head. One of the happiest days of my life up there with the birth of my children. But I shudder to think... Well, the man known as Old Big Ed would have made of one story out today, and it's this. England will take three special fragrances with them when they head to Germany this summer for Euro 2024. Joining me now is sports broadcaster Ben Jacobs. Ben, what on earth is going on? We've heard it all. Why on earth do footballers need three of their own pongs? Well, it's just home from home. England go to a major tournament. It's about 90 miles west of Leipzig. And the feeling is in the common areas, there's a familiar smell similar to St. George's Park where they train in the gym. There's a more arousing or energizing smell in the bedrooms. You've got the lavender to help send them to sleep. So it's just about fine margins, I guess. And you go away from home, it can be relatively difficult. So why not some familiarity? And smell is a part of that. Well, I don't know if um, young footballers will need arousing smells in their bedrooms during a tournament, Ben. Well, the lavender's in the bedroom, let's be clear. The one that's supposed to get them up and about is in the gym. But I think the thing about England is that they look at all these little areas and they might be derided. I remember when Liverpool got a throw-in coach and everybody mocked it as well. But if they win the tournament, then we'll all be getting the three fragrances in our own homes as well. Doesn't this just underline the fact, though, that the good old footballers of yore who are kicking lumps out, out of each other, those days are all gone. This lot are more bothered about pongs, aftershaves, moisturisers, maybe even having their nails done? No, I think it's just 
science is one aspect, psychological aspects are others, and you can just play the game and kick lumps out of each other and you reference Brian Clough, but he didn't have the science at his disposal. I'm not saying that he would have used it, and it's very easy to mock all of this, but does it actually make any difference to the football, or is it an enhancement that might give you an element of marginal gain? If it doesn't, you've not lost anything. It just smells nice, and it feels like you've got a home away from home, and if it does pay off, then it's the kind of finer planning away from the training and the football that might be that small bit of difference between winning the Euros and not. OK, Ben Jacobs, we're going to have to leave it there. I mean, if, if and when England lose on penalties, maybe they can blame it on the wrong kind of pong. Astonishing. You couldn't make it up. What would Brian Clough make of that? He used to give his team a crate of champagne before a cup final. No doubt they all smelt of best bitter. Now they'll be smelling of lavender in the bedrooms. Astonishing. Right, that's all from me for tonight. It's been fantastic to join you, but don't forget to join us from 6am tomorrow. It's breakfast with Stephen and Anne, followed by Britain's Newsroom at 9.30. And then it's Tom and Emily with good and afternoon Britain from midday then you'll get my ugly mush back at 3 p.m. I'll be here till 6 as usual I'm Martin Dormley and this is GB News next it's Jubes and Co but before that it's time for your weather forecast with Alex Deacon a brighter outlook with Bob Solar sponsors of weather on GB News Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. It is going to turn colder, certainly feeling much fresher tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine around, but there will still be some blustery showers. Uh, tonight, we've got this band of rain moving south from this weather front, a cold front, and that is also introducing that chillier feel. Already into the far northwest, the uh, rain and drizzle across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will slowly edge away through this evening. So turning damp overnight across much of Northern England, Wales, and eventually that rain trickling into the Midlands too. Much of Southern England, East Anglia will stay uh, dry. Clearer spells will follow, but the colder air will also follow, and some very gusty winds, a very windy night across northern Scotland. It will be quite mild again in the south, but it's going to be a different feel here tomorrow. Dull and damp over the Midlands, South Wales and southern England through the morning. The rain and drizzle trickling across the southeast may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. It'll then brighten up over the Midlands, northern England and Wales with some good spells of sunshine. Lots of showers, though, also packing in those showers of snow over the hills in Scotland. And very windy still in the north. And that colder feel, we will all notice that drop in temperatures. A chilly weekend ahead as well. Loads of showers packing in as well. Saturday will see some sunny spells, but be prepared for downpours wherever you are. Some hail and thunder mixed in and more snow over the hills as well. And that chillier feel with temperatures for many of us staying in single figures. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free